Paul is the real founder of Christianity, not Jesus Christ. And you see in the writings of all the evangelists, what are they teaching? You see, Paul, 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 nobody tells you what Jesus says. Jesus says you must not even look upon a woman to lust after her. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. But they all dance with other people's wives and daughters. They preach this in Sundays. They put you into ecstasy. Sermon, what Jesus said. But as soon as they go out, they're dancing with other people's wives and uh, daughters with bare backs and bosoms almost coming out with a few drinks to weaken the resistance. And they think nothing of it. Why? Because Jesus has, didn't have the time to explain. So he said, somebody else is coming after me who will guide you into all truth. And that spirit of truth is Muhammad. That comforter is Muhammad. I look forward, next time when I come here, inshallah, I'd like to deliver a, talk, a, a lecture on that subject. However, you have the opportunity. In, in reference to my um, previous question, you did, you did uh, satisfy the, the question that God does provide forgiveness for sin. Um, what, I'm, I'm curious that if if he does do this, what, how, can, how can people of the Islam faith be, be certain that they have been forgiven, be certain that they'll make it to heaven, that they will finally reach the destination? You see, the mis Muslim is given a formula. The formula is same as I read out to you from the book of Ezekiel. Same, no difference. That, but if the sinner if the sinner will repent from all that he has done and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. I mean, spiritually, he will not be destroyed. If you repent and now, try to the best of your ability, you try to do right, it is acceptable in the sight of God. The very fact that now you eschew what you have done, you might, make, you might fall again and again a million times. But sincerely, if you repent to God, he will overlook your faults and forgive you a million times. This is the God of mercy. You say he's a God of love. Then he must be a God of love. He's not like Shylock wanting his pound of flesh. Look, you slipped, and now I must make you to pay for it. You made this mistake. I must now twist your ears. I must pull your eyebrows. I must pull your eyelashes. This is not God. You know, this is Shylock you're describing to me. God is not Shylock. He forgives sins, the Bible says. He said, I forgive sins for my own sake, not for your sheep and goats and cows and blood. For my own sake. The thing you have to do is like the prodigal son. Just make up your mind to return. That's all. You made a mistake? He says, I repent, O oh Lord, to the, forgive me, and I will not do it again. Maybe you fall again, sincerely. You say, O oh Lord, I have fallen again. Forgive me, and he'll forgive you. A million times, because he's not Shiloh. He doesn't want blood. He wants you. He is a loving father in heaven. We believe in that. But now the concept that the Christian gives, that he must have blood. We say, this is not God. Adam and Eve sinned, says the Christian. They ate the forbidden fruit for which they were kicked out. Kicked out of the garden. I am asking, is that not punishment enough? From felicity, anything they wanted, they could have had. They want grapes. Oops is there. They want chops, mm, is there. Everything they wanted, no exertion, no sweating. They got everything. Now they kicked out from that condition. Is that not punishment enough? No, says the Christians, not enough. So God goes out of his way now and he curses them. He's thrown them out, now he curses them. That you, women, for what you have done, you must now bear children in pain and suffering. Labor, you must labor in childbirth as a punishment for what Eve did, poor thing. And you man, you must sweat for your bread. No more easy life for you. I'm asking, is that not punishment enough? Still kicked out, now cursed, men and women, and still we're suffering. Everybody's got to sweat for his bread. And every woman has children in pain and suffering, labor. Not enough? No, says the Christian. He said, everybody goes to hell. For what? For the original sin. What Adam and Eve did. God now is going to pursue you. At the beginning of 1986, there will be 4.8 billion people on earth, and everyone goes to hell, says the Christian. Why? Because of what Adam and Eve did. The original sin. You inherited it. It's part of your nature now. And God is going to make you to pay for that. Kicked out of the garden, sweating for my bread, woman pay, bearing children, parents suffering. Not enough. Now he's going to put us all in hell for what Adam did. I'm asking, brother, did Adam ask you before eating the apple? Did he? He asked you. 
Shall I eat the apple? Did he ask you? No. My sister there, did he ask you before eating the apple? How can God hold you responsible? Is he a lunatic? This God is he a lunatic? Going to make you responsible for something that you were not consulted about? Does it make sense? Huh? It's a, you know, Major Yeats Brown, in his life of a Bengal Lancer, he says, no heathen tribe has ever conceived so grotesque an idea, such a filthy, dirty idea. No heathen tribe, no, no backward nation, no South Sea Islander or Papuan ever conceived so grotesque an idea involving, as it does the assumption, that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him, this inherited from Adam. And for this stain, for which he was not personally responsible, was to be atoned for. And that the creator of all things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize this mysterious curse. He said, no heathen tribe has ever conceived such a so nonsensical idea. But the man who lands on the moon, he tells you that. Same guy sitting on his backside here in America is telling the Jews in 73, that look, the Arabs are on the move. The Arabs are on the march. They are moving. The guys didn't hit the warning. He said, we know these Arabs, man. Every time they come into battle before that, they shout. So we'll hit you. We'll do this. And we're coming. He said, no, no, no. It's not the Arab way, you know, to work silently, softly. So they were caught off guard, 73. First time in the history of Arab-Israeli conflict, caught off guard because they didn't, didn't heed this, their godfather here. If they'd heed it, Sadat could never have crossed the Barlev line. He could have never done it. He could never have gone into the, uh, the Sinai. You see? So I said, this guy here, can he be wrong? The answer is no. So whatever he says must be true. I said, look, my brothers, please, don't allow people to pull wool over your eyes. Think, man, think. See, this is the most nonsensical idea on earth. Adam and Eve sinning, and you're going to go to hell for that. And the way out is that the same God now, he knows there's no way. No way he can change these people. So he must come down to earth. Go into a woman's womb and live there for nine months. Born like any other human child. With all the filth and the muck which made his mother impure for 40 days, says the Bible. Circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcised on the eighth day. Living like any other human. Eating food drinking milk from his mother's breast, wetting his napkins, eating food, having a call of nature, and beaten and chased around the almighty God of this universe. He took that role, and he died for you at the age of 33. Please, brothers, now, what is this? What is this? Where did you get all these things from? Give us an opportunity. It's about time that the Muslims took it up. That this most nonsensical ideas on earth are getting converts. They're stealing their children in your own countries. You are here. You are God sent here. You. They are thinking that you are sent to them. It's God sent. He's making their mouths water. He's making the Christians' mouth water. You see? He says, these expatriates, these students, you see, now we have stupendous advantages against them, which we never had before. I have to explain this. You see what the Christians are saying? You must know. I'm reading from the Zwema Institute, the records, what they say. They say that, you see, we have five advantages against the Muslims now, which we never had before. Number one, we can now work from a home base. We live in Tucson with our wife and children, and we can go and catch up these guys one by one. Home base. We don't have to go to foreign lands, thousands of miles away from home base. They can work in, from the comforts of their own homes. They can work. Number one. Number two, so culturally, these guys, you people, are fit to receive the message, culturally. They, in Bangladesh, they have to sit on the floor, on the mat, flies buzzing, and the smoke coming from the, from the kitchen, smarting the eyes. Here, yeah, nice, comfortable, your sofa, chairs, you know, your dining table and your chairs, your air-conditioned homes, everything. Culturally, you are fit to receive the message. They, it's a backward people. They have to go and sit down and reach down to their level. Two. Linguistically, they have to learn the language of the native. If they went to Bangladesh, they must learn Bangladeshi. 